Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to finish reading the first book of Protector of the Small, First Test, written by Tamir Tamora Pierce and uh, published by Random House. We're going to pick up where we left off with the final chapter, Chapter 11, Spidrin Hunt. After a hard morning's ride, they were given shelter from the light rain in the forest village's large, largest barn. Once the horses were tended, everyone gathered around the night commander to eat. At first, there was no sound but chewing. They were so hungry that even oat cakes, dried fruit, and water tasted good. Finally, Lord Raoul, Raoul cleared his throat. You young fellows may not know, but the rain is good for this kind of work. We can track better in the mud, and with spider runs, we need all the help we can get. We can't use the dogs this time. Unless they're trained for it, dogs won't hunt them. They just turn tail and run. Maybe they're smarter than we are. There was a quiet chuckle from his listeners. We have talisman to warn us of their presence, but the spiderons have spells to shield themselves. They're absolutely fearless too. You first and second year pages, you'll carry staff. If you're attacked, use the staff to hold the beast off and yell like mad. I mean it, no heroics. Not against spiderons, commented a blunt nosed buzzier. They'll gag you with webs and hack your arms off before you know your sword is gone. The spiderons will stick to the trees if they're thick, as they are hereabouts, continued the night commander. That's what they prefer. They also go for bare rock. That's why they're hard to track. Now, which one of you local fellows gives us a map? A young man in hunter's greens and browns came forward. He used a stick to draw in the beaten earth of the floor, marking out streams, hills, and gorges. Everyone paid close attention. At last, Lord Raoul got to his feet. There was a lot of him to straighten up from a crouch. Seen from up close by, his shoulders and chest were as broad as the palace wall. We hunt spiderons together, he said. No going off alone because you think you see something. Each of you pairs up with one of my men. Tell him if you see anything of interest. Now arm up. Horses, asked one of the third year pages. You heard our guide. A lot of what's around is boggy. You don't want spiderons above you while your mount is wallowing. The horses stay here. I'm just as glad, Cal told Peach Blossom, slipping him an apple. I'd hate to risk you on something when I don't know what I'm about. Peach Blossom slobbered on her tunic as if he was bestowed a horse's blessing. Lord Raoul's second in command, Captain Flinden, paired up men and pages briskly. Cal was placed in the charge of the older Bazir soldier, the one who had mentioned arms getting hacked off. He nodded to her. I'm Cuisine, he said, and pointed to her shoulders. You have a feather rash. She blinked, confused, and then realized he was talking about the sparrows. They were so light that she forgot they had perched on her. Sorry, sir, she said meekly. I don't have much control over them. Once we're moving, they'll go into the trees. To her surprise, the hard-faced man opened an open paw, offered an open hand to her friends. He had grin in his palm. The grin on his face made the small birds lit. The grin on his face as the small birds lit on his palm and helped themselves made Cal smile in reply. When the grain was eaten and the sparrows returned to Kel, he was all business again. Get your staff. What's your name? The second in command had made his pairings by pointing to a page and then a soldier. Kel, sir. I'm only Kuzim, not sir. Get your staff. Kel obeyed. As she did, she noticed that the third and fourth years were armed with long spears, as were half the men of the own. The remaining men bore crossbows. All of the soldiers and the third and fourth year boys carried swords as well. I wish I had a glaive, Cal thought passionately. She was scared. If only Lord Wilden wasn't so fixed in his ways. Once they were armed, Lord Raoul broke them into three groups, ten soldiers in each. He led one group. Captain Flinden had the group that included Kel and Cuisine, while Lord Wilden took the third. One of the village men was placed with each group as a guide. Neil was in Lord Raoul's group. Cal was a little jealous. She would have liked to watch the famed knight work at close range. They communicated by means of spelled pendants worn by each group leader. Quazim explained that the advantage of the pendants was that the spider wind wouldn't realize they had been seen since they wouldn't hear a horn call. They would have less chance to summon help. The men of the king's old also used a secret language of hand signals while they were in sight of one another. As their company moved into the surrounding forest, the rain continued to fall. It deadened the sound of their passage. That quiet was comforting to Kel. 
there is a difference between coming up behind a grazing deer and approaching a prey that was clever, vicious, large, and fast. The thought of being stone was not helpful just then. She remembered her mother, facing the Scandran raiders. Had the lioness in battle against giants felt as if she wanted to crawl away someplace safe? Of course not, and neither would Kel. She would be steadfast like her mother, like Alana the lioness. The hunters followed the signs left when the spider ants had taken a cow, which was too big to be carried to the trees. When that trail ended at a stream, the three companies split up. Halts were called as each group found something that might lead them to their foes. All those clues to the spider ants' whereabouts failed. The creatures knew they were being hunted and they were careful to hide their tracks. Now and then someone would find abandoned webs. The men of the King's Own could judge from experience just how old the things were and how long it had been since Spiderins had used them. It was nervous work. All of them, even the vet veteran men, kept one eye on the trees. This part of the forest was old and untouched by humans. Some trees rose over 130 feet into the air. Kel saw how they would make a road for the creatures that could swing across the gaps on web ropes. On the forest floor, the light was gray, weaving through the foliage to brush carpets of rotting brown leaves. While the tree cover held the worst of the rain off, the hunters, it dripped dully, adding to the gloomy feel of the air. They heard no animals except Kel's sparrows, who chattered and talked amongst themselves. After yet another halt, as if as though they waited to as they waited to see if someone else had found anything useful, Kazim sat on a log and nodded for Kel to do the same. Half of the sparrows climbed on the man to see if he'd hidden more seed from them. The rest sat on or beside Kel, fluffing wet feathers and shaking themselves out. Crown hopped onto Kel's eye, uh, a knee and eyed her, head tilted first to one side. Kel offered a finger. When Crown hopped on, she raised the bird before her face. I wish I were Dane, she said very quietly. I'd ask if you could flit about and find those spiderins. You would be wonderful spies. We shall find them, we must, Kazim assured her. When Kel raised her eyebrows in question, he explained, often they bite off a victim's limb and then slap web on it to keep them from dying of blood loss. The woman they took may yet live. Kel felt her stomach roll. I really wish we could find them then, she said hotly, and sooner rather than later. They are monsters. Captain Flinden waved them to their feet, for it had come through, another dead end. As, Crown st as Kel stood, Crown hopped to the log and began to chatter. When she stopped, the entire flock sped off. Kel shrugged and resettled her grip on her staff. They searched the boggy ground that threatened to yank their boots from their feet and then uphill until they rejoined Lord Raoul's and Lord Wilden's groups. The men in the pages relaxed. The officers went apart to confer. Kel was having a drink from her water bottle when the spear sparrows returned, twittering and shrieking. They whirled around her like a small cyclone. Kel, who had come over to N Neil, who had come over to talk with her, covered his ears with muddy hands. Must they be so shrill? He demanded. Crown and a male sparrow hovered before Kel's face. They both clutched a long stick. When Kel held out her hand, the sparrows dropped their burden. Holding up the stick, Kel noticed a fat gray-green worm was dangling from the end. Or was it a worm? She looked closer. She had seen this gray-green stuff before. Kazim? He snatched the twig from her. My lord, he called. Grabbing Kel's shoulder, Kazim towed her over to Lord Raoul, Lord Wilden, and Captain Flinden. Kel's sparrows trailed her like a flying scarf, with Neil close behind them. Crown perched on the girl's shoulder and wiped her beak on Kel's ear. Kazim gave the twig to Lord Raoul. The big man raised his eyebrows and touched the web. It clung so well that he had to use his belt knife to scrape it off his skin. This is fresh, he commented, letting Lord Wilden have a look at it. Where did you find this? Kazim pointed to Kel, who gulped. My lord, she began. Call him sir, he prefers it, murmured Kazim. Sir, Kel said, my sparrows brought it to me. Pets? asked Lord Raoul, raising his brows. We aren't we weren't allowed them in my day. They aren't pets exactly, Kel explained nervously, keeping an eye on Lord Wilden. They live in the courtyard outside my room and I feed them and they seem to like me. And and Neil, Neil of Queen's Cove, he says the palace animals are so much cleverer since Dane came up there. Lord Wilden's mouth twisted and Kel shut up. Too bad they can't lead us to the Spiderins. Any idea how far they may have flown before they encountered this? 
Kel shook her head. She had an idea, though she knew that Lord Wilden would not want to hear it. She hesitated and then decided she had nothing to lose. My Lord Knight Commander, she began. Kazim nudged her. Sir, Kel corrected herself. I think they could lead us to the Spiderins. Are you a wild mage too, asked the big knight. You can speak with them. No, Kel admitted, but I think they understand more than you'd guess. They know who's planning a dirty trick on Kel and who isn't, Kel said abruptly. They know who's her friend and who isn't. Sir, if Kel thinks that they might lead us, maybe we should listen. Kel looked around, startled. Faron had drawn closer while Ruel had examined the spider and web. She's smart about a lot of things, added Merrick, standing close to Neil. Whatever some people say. Neil and Faron nodded in agreement when Lord Raoul looked at each of them. Crown rose from her shoulder, fluttering, and called to the other. They flew with her to the clearing's edge and perched on a tree. Crown then flew back to Kel, chattering, turned, and rejoined her flock. Lord Raoul scratched his head. This is what I've come to, he said mournfully, following little birdies. He singled out first a local guide and then ten pages and soldiers, including Kazim and Joran. To his second, he said, I'll take him, Flindon. You may want to break out blaze bomb and torches. He glanced at the sky. It'll be dark soon. Feed everyone and then save, for so save some for us. All right, youngster, he said to Cal. They know you best and your friends seem to think you've got a head on your shoulders. Let's see how quiet you can lead. You're on point. But sir, she argued, Wilden would never approve. They're your birds, Sir, sir Raoul told us. Do you think they can lead us? If you're not sure, we'll just keep fumbling around. Crown cheeped impatiently at Cal. The girl took a deep breath. <sighs> yes, sir, I think they can lead us. Then let's go, ordered Sir Raoul. Cal looked up into the big man's slow back black eyes and sighed. Resetting her grip on her staff, she walked over to the sparrow's tree. They took off, leading her towards a trail cut through, through a cut in two rocks. She advanced as quietly as she knew how, keeping an eye for brush and pebbles underfoot. She was on her metal with seven men and three of the pages following. Even if I can't come back, she thought fiercely, I'll have done this much. I'll have led a spidron hunting party. The sparrows landed within view, on top of a flat rock. As soon as she drew even with them, they flew again, taking care to remain in sight. There was no two ways about it. They knew where they were going, and they wanted her to follow. The humans climbed through what seemed to be an endless tumble of stone, until the birds checked at the top of the rise and came speeding back to Kel. They immediately landed on every perch her body might offer, feathers raised, quivering. Who needs a wild mage when they've been, they're saying, plain as heralds, that they've seen monsters? Lord Ryle's voice was an almost soundless murmur in her ear. She hadn't even heard the big knight come up beside her. He motioned to her to stay put, got low to the ground, and then inched his way to the top of the pile of boulders that formed the crest. Three of them formed a triangle of space. He unclipped his spyglass from a, his belt, opened it, and thrust it into the triangle. After a few minutes, he closed the glass and worked his way down from his vantage point. With hand signals, he urged the party to fall back. At last, he signaled the halt. The men in pages drew close to hear what he'd seen. He rubbed a hand across his mouth for a moment and said, There may be more in the cave I saw, but rough count? I make out about 20 of the things. I'm guessing most are here, now that dark's coming on, and since we didn't spot any out raiding today. They've layered up in a pocket on the far side of that rise. There's a waterfall in the northwest end. It forms a stream that runs out in two branches, east and southeast, that leaves about 30 feet of open ground in front of that cave. There's trees and more rocks on the north and northeast sides of the valley. The cave is part of that rock. He looked at the local guide. It's Lady's Fall, the man told him. The gentry pic picnic there sometimes. The cave's big enough that youngins feel bold exploring it, but there's no warren. They can be bottled up in there. What of the valley itself? Are there other approaches than the one we just took? asked Kazim. There's a rock stair carved by the fall, said their guide. We can take the woodcutter's road to reach it without entering the valley. Have they put webs in the rocks around the fall? Lord Raoul shook his head. Then maybe they don't know about the stair. It's slippery and it's head well. There's a deal trayer across the fork in the stream. It runs past where we left your forests, my lord. Left your soldiers, my lord. Lord Raoul nodded. Let's get to them. Time to go to work. Two of the mages of the own set up magical shields that would hide them from the spider ins detection as long as everyone stayed in one spot. Once that was done, the leaders of the force worked out their, their attack. As they did, Kel looked at the map that Lord Roel had drawn in the mud. The spider had picked their camp well. A broad, deep stream lay across the front of their cave, which was set in rocky hills and thick woods. 
the Knight Commander drew lines to show where creatures had spun webs and stretched them across gaps between trees. Some of the soldiers had sacks of powder that would melt the spiderons' webs. Once the element of secrecy was lost, the humans could also light torches to defend themselves from attack and from the webs. Lord Rao's scouting party ate as the plans were laid. Kel's bread tasted like wood, the thick, cold slices of ham like greasy lead. After Hakun told the uh, told them the Yamani proverb, those who do not eat before battle are eaten by battle, Kel made herself chew and swallow her food. She could not face more than two bites of cheese and gave her share to Seaver. I think I'm going to faint, Neil muttered in her ear. Me too, she replied. They smiled weakly at one another. Once again, the party was split up, one group under Lord Rahul, the other under Lord Wilden. The two lords divided their commands into three ranks. The first was made up of spearmen and mages, the second of bowmen and spearmen, and the third of torchbearers and lookouts. Kel, Neil, and the other first and second year pages were in the third rank, with one exception. Esmond was, was placed in the second rank because he could cast bright light. They'll see more of fighting, grumbled Merrick. Kazim overheard, depend on it, boy, you will see more than you want. Lord Raoul explained how each rank would use weapons, magic, and the torches. Once everyone understood precisely how he wanted things done, he said, my group will enter the valley from this end, along this branch of the stream. Lord, Raoul, Lord Raoul nodded to the rushing water that ran by the spot where they had gathered. Lord Wilden's group will come down that rock stair by the fall and hit them from the opposite side. We'll meet and push them back on that cave. You lads were taking a chance on you, but your training master says you're all up for it. Even me, Kel wondered. I listen when Lord Wilden speaks, so don't prove him wrong, finished Lord Raoul. Third rank to me, Wilden said coolly. As the pages and two men who had been assigned to help them gathered around, he said quietly, the torches in your charge are important. But in more important still is your task as lookouts. Your eyes must not be in front towards the fighting, but towards the back. Keep an eye on the trees, the stream, and the open ground. If the spiderins are outside this valley when we strike, they may attack from behind and roll us up. Do not let that happen. If you see movement, yell at the rear. The bowmen will listen for it and cover you. He looked at them all for a moment and then continued. The first two ranks will go forward, pressing the spiderins into the cave. You stay put. We need you to spread out to give yourself the best chance of seeing any surprises. He paused and then said, what's the warning call? At the rear, they chorused. Very well. He looked at them each and then put his palms together. The pages did the same. Lord Mithros granted victory. If you are merciful, granted at not too high a price. So mote it be. So mote it be, murmured the pages. Take a spear, all of you, he ordered. I don't care what else you're holding. If a spider comes at you, drop it and get that spear up. When he went to speak Lord Raoul, to Lord Raoul, Neil murmured to Kel, trust the stump to have a cheerful outlook. Not too high a price indeed. Kel looked at Sugarhead at him. You think we'd get out of this without a scratch? Nobody doesn't have to put the idea in people's heads. The men were signaling for quiet. The mages were about to remove the wards that kept them hidden. They all gathered their weapons and supplies and separated into their groups. Gods of mountains and the river, Kel thought and Yamani, please don't let me bring dishonor to my teachers and family. She collected a spear. The local guide led them to the woodcutter's road and onto the waterfall stair. It was cut deep and narrow in the rock beside the fall, which meant that Kel never had to look down from a height, only to, to the next few steps. One thing that held on that slippery descent, besides the roaring water, was the full moon lit the way. Kel thanked the goddess, whose lamp was the moon, when she nearly stepped on a section of rock polished like glass by the water's passage. The light showed her the danger just in time. The bottom of the stair was screened by a tall stand of lilacs. The leafy branches hid them from view in the valley. As they waited, Kel saw Lord Wilden murmur into the spell pendant he wore. He raised a hand. The men and older pages of the first rank prepared themselves. Lord Wilden's arms dropped, and he led the first wave of their attacking party forward. They ran in silence to fall on the spider ends, lazing around fires by the stream. Something bright exploded high overhead. A ball of the sticky black paste called Blazebong, set off by a human mage. That was the signal for the second group of warriors, archers, and spearmen to run into the open ground. Behind them came the third rank. All of them, including Neil and Cal, had bundles of torches on their back and a torch in their free hand. As they ran, they held their torches out to their sides. 
When spiderons began to charge from the cave, human mages called on their power. The torches held out by the page burst into flame. The two groups of humans came together once more and lined up with their backs to the stream. Now there were human shouts as counterpoints to the shrilling of spiderons. The boom and crack of magic and the clang of metal against metal added to the racket. A loop of web shot high in the air, glowing yellow-green as spider and webs did at night. Kel saw lattices of the gleaming stuff, potential traps to her left and right. She watched the flying ropes of web until Neil shouted in her ear, We're lookouts, remember? Oops, said Kel. Following her orders, she thrust her bundle of unlit torches into the ground end first, so those in the second rank could grab them at need. She lit them all from the torch she carried, and then passed that torch to a soldier in the second rank who reached for it. Turning her back on the torches and the fight, Cal settled her spear into her grip and began to watch the gold splotched darkness in front of her. The night blindness that came from looking at the burning, burning torches took a few minutes to fade. Once it did, she saw the ground and trees on the other side of the water clearly. Glancing to her side, she noticed that Seaver watched the fight, not the water or trees. She nudged him with a booted foot. Seaver, he looked at him. We're sentries, she reminded him. He looked around, gulped, and then nodded. Quickly, he placed his load of torches and nudged his neighbor, Quindon. He, too, had forgotten his order. Kel had to fight the urge to turn and see how the battle went. Every time her curiosity was about to win, she envisioned the spiderin that had eaten the kittens and kept her eyes where they belonged. From the shouts of the fighter, she knew the first two ranks were pressing the spiderins back towards their cave. The creatures fought desperately, many armed with swords or axes and powerful forelegs. There would be no surrender. This was a fight to the death. Kells scanned the light dappled water and shadowed trees. The sh stream shifted and then bulged. A spiderin leapt from the water into the stream's bank. It carried twin axes. At, she squeaked, her throat bone dry. Four more spiderins climbed onto land in the wake of the first. Kel found her voice and shouted, At the rear! At the rear! Seaver turned. He'd been watching the fight again. He gasped when he saw the leading spider in just yards away. His face hardened and he cried, you killed my father. He charged the enemy. The spider reared on its hind legs to clear its spinret. Cal knew that, that move. She had seen it at Midland. Neil, Merrick, she cried to the boys on either side of her and Seaver. She reached with her spear to knock Seaver's feet from under him. He went sprawling as a loop of web, what lashed at the spot where he'd been. Glancing to Merrick's far side, Cal shouted, Quind! Quinlan, all of you, three steps forward. She ran up beside Seaver. The leading spider and dragged back its web, letting it catch on the fallen boy. Kel sensed Neil and Merrick coming forward as she did. Their spears pointed at their foe. Quindon, for all he didn't like her, was just half a step behind. He and Merrick screamed, at the rear, when they saw the five spiderins were coming at them. The sight of not one page, but four in a steady line, all armed with spears, made the spiderins hesitate. Seaver wept in rage, rage as he used his belt knife to hack at the web that clung to him. He didn't see five crossbow boats sink into the spiderin that had thrown it. The spiderin lurched back and reared again, trying to shoot more web at the short line of pages. The tilt of the ground betrayed it, making it tumble back into the stream. Seaver cut himself free just when the spiderin's web could have dragged him after its spinner. On your feet, Kel urged him, kicking his spear closer. Come on! Seaver grabbed the spear he dropped and lurched to his feet as the other four spiderins charged the page's line. Kel watched the closest, her pulse hammering in her ears. It came at her with a raised axe in each foreclaw, screeching its fury. Kel promptly forgot her staff lessons. Holding the spear as she would her glaive, she cut it in a sidelong arc. The weapon's slim razor point sliced through the spiderin's chest and arm, releasing a spray of dark blood. Kel reversed the spear and cut back, dragging the blade down. It bit into the spiderin at the neck and stuck there as crossbow bolts riddled the immortal. Kel had to let the spear go. She looked to either side to see how her friends had done. Three attackers lay dead, crossbow bolts still came from, sticking from their hides like quills and a hedgehog. One had dragged Quindon's spear from its hand. Merrick had cut off the forelegs of another spiderin before the archers killed it. One spiron had, had fallen about a foot away from Neil, its curved sword touching his boot. Neil's spear transfixed the thing, entering at the chest and emerging through its back. Neil, breathed Cal, impressed, pinned it like a beetle on a card. 
I'm going to be sick, croaked Neil and was. Back into line, roared Lord, Lord, roared Lord Wilden from the far end of their row. Get tortures if your spears are gone. Neil, Seaver, Cal, Merrick, and Quinden obeyed. When the fight was nearly over, the soldiers found that they had one more job. Inside the cave was a clutch of more than 30 young, feeding on the body of the village woman. None were taller than 18 inches, but when they saw the human, they rushed to the attack. The men in pages kept them at bay with their swords so they could roll a barrel of blaze bomb into the nest. A mage whispered, and the blaze bomb roared into flames. Hearing the young shriek as they burned, Cal found it was her turn to vomit. Two days later, they returned to the palace, a quiet and weary group. They had packing to do and one final supper in the mess hall. To the pages' surprise, they were joined by the Shang warriors and the men of the king's own who had been on the hunt. They all stood by their seats, wondering why Lord Wilden had not said the prayer and allowed them to sit. The answer came when the king arrived. He had done it on the first day of classes. As he had done not on the first day of classes, he said nothing before they ate. He had done with Lord Wilden, Lord Raoul, the two Shangs, and Captain Flynn at Lord Wilden's table. No pages were asked to wait on them. Servants performed that task, while the pages and the men of the on relaxed over their food. There was a treat, pie made from the first berry harvest of the summer. Only when they could eat no more did the king rise to stand at the lectern. You have all had your time of fire, he told the pages quietly. Lord Wilden reports that you all did well. Did he, Cal wondered tiredly, or did he say the boys did well? The king went on. I'm glad not to have to tell your parents that you will not be coming to help with the harvest. Soft chuckles passed around the room. King Jonathan waited for them to fade. You and these warriors did important work, as bloody, dangerous, and frightening as it was. This is the kind of work that knights must do in our modern age. You may get thanks only from me, but I hope you know the value of what you did. Go home now. Laze in the sun and steal apples. Try not to get too out of practice. The realm needs your arms as strong, your hearts as steady, as when you faced those spiderins. He nodded to them and left so quickly that they were still trying to rise as the door closed behind him. Lord Wilden came to the lectern. I know you wish to pack. Get to it. Caldry of Mindelin, report to my office at next bell. I'm sorry, whispered Merrick. He got up awkwardly and fled the room. You saved my life, Seaver added, his voice cracking. He hugged her one-armed around the head as if she were one of the boys and followed Merrick out. When none of her other friends moved, Kel forced herself to rise and pick up her tray. Have a good summer, she whispered, and then took her things to the servants for the last time. She had thought she'd resigned herself to being packed off for good. From the way that her food turned into a lump in her belly, as she trudged back to her room, she hadn't done it as well as she thought. There was a letter from her mother on her bed. With all the preparations needed for Kel's older sisters, Adalia and Orani, to be presented when the court social season began that fall, her parents had come to stay at their chorus townhouse for the summer. They looked forward to seeing Kel there. As Kel read the letter, her gloom deepened. She could not stay in town with her parents and sisters. She might encounter people she knew from the palace. How could she live in the city, watching the knights come and go, knowing that she would never be one of them? I'll ask them to send me home to Anders at Mindelin, she thought sadly. They'll understand. It was a good idea, but the thought of I, the I told you so's that her sister-in-law would hurl made her cringe. Her sparrows were nowhere to be seen as she entered her room. They had rejoined the flockmates who had stayed behind, whirling around the courtyard to celebrate their return. Now they chattered as they perched in the small tree in the courtyard. I'll miss you, whispered Cal. She would ask Dane if she would still take peach blossom. With two daughters to present at court, her parents would be hard-pressed to also buy a war horse. Thinking of the birds and peach blossom, she felt her eyes sting with tears. I'm not going to let Lord Wilden see I've been crying, Kel Kel told herself. Fetching her glaive, she did a pattern dance to pass the time. The dreaded bell finally rang. Kel put her glaive down, combed her hair, and washed her face. Then she walked to Lord Wilden's office, feeling like a prisoner on the long walk to the gallows. The serving men bowed to Kel and then opened the door and announced her. She entered the office, listening to the door as it closed at her back. Lord Wilden stood with his back to her, staring through a window that opened into the palace rose garden. Was he looking at the flowers, she wondered, or maybe at the nobles who walked there as the skies grew dark? You sent for me, my lord, she said. Lord Wilden sighed and turned. Sit down, girl. 
Kel hesitated and then sat. Lord Wilden absently massaged his right arm. I want you to listen to me. I speak to you as I would to my daughters. Kel blinked at him, startled. She supposed that she knew that Lord Wilden had a wife and family, but she had forgotten it. It was hard to imagine him at any other life than that of the training master to the pages and squires. Now that you have made your point, consider the future. Soon your body will change. The things that you will want from life as a maiden will change. Pursue the course you have and you might be uh, injured by accident. He looked at his right arm and smiled crookedly. What if you fell in love? What if you came to grief or caused others to do so because your thoughts are on your heart and not combat? This year was the easiest. You think so, she asked him silently. It wasn't your year, was it? She opened her mouth to reply. Not now, he said, raising his hand. Do not answer now. Go home and think about it. You're dismissed. She had to hear him say it. I can't come back then. The training master shook his head wearily. Should you desire to return at the end of September, you may do so. I hope that you will choose otherwise. Now Kel was really confused. She stood, her knees trembling. I can come back in the fall? Lord Wilden nodded. That is what I said. You may return. Good night, Killadry. Good night, Lord Wilden. Step outside of his office, she felt a wave of giddiness sweep over her. She turned and pressed her face against the cool stones of the wall. Back in her room, she reread her mother's letter. Now she was glad her family would be in town. She could visit Peach Blossom, ride him, maybe practice what she had learned so far to be in shape for the autumn. She threw down the letter and ran into the hall, trembling with excitement. Neil, she yelled. Rald, Seaver, Merrick, I can stay. I can stay. Two weeks after moving to her parents' townhouse, Kel returned from there from an afternoon spent with Peach Blossom. To her surprise, her mother met her as she came in. Elaine looked at her and then shook her head. I'm still shocked by how much you grew this year. You think I'd be used to it by now. How much was it? Three inches? Kel nodded. I'm five foot three inches now, she said proudly. proudly. Another inch and I'll catch up with Papa. I'll be delighted, poor man, said her mother teasingly. I came to tell you that a crate arrived while you were out. There's no sign who it's from. I had a footman pry off the lid, but no one has touched it. Kel ran up to her room. A large crate filled with heaps of wood shaving waited there for her. Kel worked her way through the shavings until her fingers bumped against something large, wrapped in cloth. Well, asked Elaine. Kel turned. Both of her parents stood in the doorway, looking as puzzled as she felt. I think I need help getting it out, she said. Piers came over. Between them, he and Kel wrestled out a bulky, heavy parcel wrapped in oiled cloth. The minute Kel saw its rough shape, she guessed what it was. Her heart drummed in her chest. Using her belt knife, she cut away the cords that held the cloth around the thing. It was a saddle. Not just any saddle, but a tilting saddle, made high in the front and back. It was dark wood with brown leather fittings, but the workmanship was beautiful. And the materials were the finest that could be had. She ran her fingers over the padding, feeling how soft it was. There's no message of any kind, demanded Elaine. It's such an expensive gift, not a note. Has anyone mentioned sending you has anyone mentioned sending you a present? As she and her father searched for a note, Kel told them about her belt knife and the bruise bomb. When the crate produced nothing but wood shavings, she decided to take one more look at the saddle itself. This time she did it with her fingers, exploring each bump and crevice. When she pressed a stud set on the top rim squarely, at the center she heard a click. A section of the wooden rim flipped up. The girl saw a bit of white parchment inside and drew it out with two fingers. On it was written, Goddess Bless, Lady Page. And that is the end of the book. This is an excellent series, uh, Protector of the Small, First Test. There are three other books in this series, Page, Squire, and Lady Knight. I recommend them all. Uh, Tamara Pierce has also written a whole bunch of other series in this um, universe. Dane has her own series, Lady Alana has her own series, and there are even later series that include people like uh, Lady Alana's daughter, Many Years in the Future. Thank you for listening. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.